Today's presentation is doing sample preparation when we're going to make measurements using dynamic light scattering. You see the number four here. This is actually presentation number four in the NICOMP training class I give when we train new users to the NICOMP. So there are other parts to this presentation. One or two are on YouTube, other ones we just provide when we install these instruments. And by the way, unlike some other companies, if you buy a NICOMP from PSS, we actually send someone to install the system and train you. Before we start talking about how we're going to prepare the sample, let's talk about what is the goal of the measurement. And in terms of our goals for measurements when we do particle size analysis, we could look at, well, are we trying to make it accurate? Are we trying to make it precise? When we talk about precision, we talk about repeatability and reproducibility. But when we use these terms in the particle size world, we use a very specific approach. When we talk about accuracy, we're saying, is this answer very similar to the answer we would get from a referee technique? Now, this gets very tricky in the subatomic world because there aren't really many other referee techniques we can look at. So when we talk about accuracy in the world of dynamic light scattering, we can only really talk about polystyrene latex, PSLs, because this is the kind of sample that we know what the answer should be as measured by other techniques. So when we talk about accuracy with DLS, we talk about, well, if we run a PSL, do we get the same answer? Repeatability is usually we prepare a sample, we place it into the instrument, and we maybe make three measurements, and we check to see if it is repeatable. And we want to see those within at least 10%. All of these numbers and suggestions are sample dependent. When we talk about reproducibility, this is where we prepare it, measure it, take an answer, and then repeat the whole process. Sample prep, measure, do we get the same answer? So this is important when we might want to do something like we're going to create a method, and then if we have to transfer the method to another location. So these are three ways we can define are we making a good measurement. And now we're going to just take a quick diversion into the world of method development and expectations when using dynamic light scattering. The data you're going to see here is something that I wrote up last year in this technical note on DLS method development and validation. I took a fairly easy sample, which is a propofol, a pharmaceutical emulsion, and I did what you could call an intermediate precision test. Two systems, two operators on two different days. You see the results here from system A and from system B. And what we usually focus on when using dynamic light scattering is the intensity mean and the polydispersity index. And you see very similar results here, but not the exact same. This is because of all of the things involved with the measurement. They are actually different systems. The sample is prepared by two different people. But these are the kind of results we should expect when measuring fairly easy systems. We look at 200 and 207, not right on top of each other, but fairly close. This is real world results, and you look at the polydispersity index. If we do multiple measurements, we see the coefficient of variation, which is a standard deviation divided by the mean times 100. Very low coefficients of variations, but if we look at the coefficient of variation on the polydispersity index, which is the calculation of the breadth of the distribution, we see much larger numbers. And sometimes, specifically, if we're in the pharmaceutical industry, we just have guidelines we have to work under where this kind of breadth of coefficient of variation might be concerning. Now, another way we could approach this is rather than just using the mean and the polydispersity index is if we used the D10, D50, D90 values, we could see we have much better repeatability calculations using these values to calculate the breadth of the distribution. If you look at the ISO standard for DLS, it says look at mean and polydispersity index, but if you need to do method transfer and set specifications, sometimes using D10, D50, D90 just makes these calculations look better. So if you're going to create a new method using dynamic light scattering and then transfer it to another location, the values you see on the right are the kind of numbers I would suggest be used in terms of how close should the two systems be. With the intensity mean, maybe plus or minus 20%, and for the breadth of the distribution calculations, maybe something like plus or minus 30%. So there's a slight digression here to talk about what should we expect with repeatability and with reproducibility when using dynamic light scattering. Now let's go back to addressing the subject of accuracy and this is where does our result compare to a known result. And as I would mentioned before the known result is a tricky business here in dynamic light scattering and the search for absolute truth is best left to philosophers not to people doing particle size measurements. 
The only way we can really get a leg in reality for accuracy is to say if we take a known sample, which is a polystyrene latex sample, do we get the expected result? And if you're going to be using DLS and results matter, this is something you should be testing fairly frequently. And let's look at the procedure we use to test the accuracy of our system. Very specifically, when using the NICOMP, we suggest the use of these two standards. They're very similar. They both come from Thermal Fisher. This is actually the one that is NIST traceable, and this is the one that isn't, but it's less expensive. You can get just as good of results. These are the two samples we typically use. They're nominal 90 nanometer standards. And what we're going to do is talk about the sample preparation, which we'll do in the next few slides and also our glassware and what else is important to get very good results when testing the accuracy of the system. Now we're going to dilute these samples and when we're doing our best work we don't dilute with DI water. We actually suggest preparing a 10 millimolar sodium chloride solution and I give you the values here you would use to create this concentration of sodium chloride solution and this is always very filtered water. If we're going to use the 3090A polystyrene latex, we pipette 30 microliters into 5 ml of filtered solution. If we use the other standard, the 5009A, then it's 30 microliters into 50 ml of solution. And yes, we always filter the solution we're diluting with. Even if we've created this salt solution with filtered water, when we create these dilutions, we take that filtered sodium chloride solution, we filter it again, usually through a disk filter, because what we want to do is remove any large particles that might throw off the result, because here we're really interested in getting the most accurate as possible result. These are the system settings on the NICOP I would recommend for doing these measurements and the kind of things to notice here on the right. The viscosity is essentially the viscosity of water. So this is our standard value of viscosity entered here. I typically would suggest leaving all of these selections on automatic. I only go in and change these when I know something about the sample. And down here you see I've set the system up to do three 10 minute measurements. Don't be in a hurry when you're doing dynamic light scattering measurements. So I do three measurements that are 10 minutes long. You could do a shorter measurement for very narrow distributions, but I'm showing you here best practices. And these are the conditions under which we would set up the system to make these measurements of the polystyrene latex standard. And in terms of the pass-fail criteria, this is what we use when we install instruments in the pharmaceutical industry and do an IQ OQ. And what we do is we say plus or minus 15% on the intensity mean for the accuracy, then also check the repeatability and make sure they are plus or minus 5%. And if you meet this criteria, then you can say, I know my system is working. Once you have tested the system at one size, there's really no additional value to testing at other sizes. With dynamic light scattering, there's also no way you can change a calibration curve or in any other way alter the system. You either pass or you fail. What happens if you fail? Well, like everyone else, first you just measure it again and say what's going on here. But if you repeatedly fail, then either you've not prepared the sample properly or you haven't set it up properly or there is a problem with the system. There's no way to just tweak the system to get the answer closer to where you want it to be. What you see here on the upper left is a very good result for running this standard. It should be a very narrow distribution. We see here we got a mean value of 90 nanometers and this polydispersity index of 0 0.007, very narrow result. That's the kind of result we like to see when we're testing the accuracy of these systems. The results you see on the upper right is measuring the same sample, but the blue value is when I did the dilution in DI water and the more pink colored result is when I did the dilution in the sodium chloride solution. And what you can see is this is actually more accurate and more narrow. And why is that? Because when we used DI water, there's actually some agglomeration taking place. And that is fighting us in terms of trying to get the absolute best answer. So this is the kind of difference between when we're very careful and we use a sodium chloride solution and we just use filtered DI water. Now, if you're just having fun in the lab and this kind of difference doesn't matter to you, then you can live with this. But if you're trying to absolutely ascertain the performance of the system, then we go through these steps as described in the previous few slides. I wrote up a rather detailed procedure for doing this test and wrote it into this technical note on system verification, which is also available on the website for download.
I'm now going to explain something funny that happened to me when I installed a system a year ago in a very large company's laboratory. And what I did is I followed these steps and measured this 90 nanometer standard, but the results were absolutely atrocious. At first, I'm saying I just installed the insert. What went wrong? Is something wrong with the laser? I open the hood, I look inside, everything was fine. And then I looked at the beaker and I took a picture of it on the right here. By the way, you can't see 90 nanometer particles. So see these giant particles that have agglomerated? This is why I was getting a poor result, was because our 90 nanometer standard had agglomerated into these giant particles. These are um, 700, 800 microns large. And I was trying to understand why did that happen? So when I thought about it, I had used the beaker they gave me in this laboratory. And when I then just took, I carry these little plastic disposable beakers with me when I travel, I used my little disposable beaker and it looked just fine. Then I took one of their glass beakers and measured again, and it looked terrible. So what was the moral of this story? Something was going on with the surface of the glass in their beakers, which was altering the surface chemistry and causing the agglomeration of our size standard. When I talked about how could this be happening, it turns out they send these beakers to an outside source and have them washed. And what I'm assuming is there's a lot of residual soap surfactant on the surface of the glass beakers. Actually, by sending them out and getting them clean, they're actually ruining the glassware for any important measurements they were making. So I hope that they made some adjustments. So this is how easy it is to get these measurements wrong because we're essentially dealing with surface chemistry here. And anything that might alter the pH or the salt concentration or the surfactant concentration can be the difference between a successful measurement and what you see here is agglomeration and terrible results. So yes, how you prepare that standard really matters. Sample prep is very important in dynamic light scattering. Next, I'm going to talk about a step that way too many people ignore, which is the effect of concentration. And there are two ways in which higher concentration samples can have deleterious effects on our measurements. The two are multiple scattering and restricted or hindered diffusion. Now, multiple scattering is described on the left here. What we really would like to see happen is when the light beam comes and hits a particle, it goes directly to the detector. But if the concentration is higher than the ideal level, what can happen is the laser hits a particle, then it hits another particle and another particle and then gets to the detector. And this is not how the algorithm is designed to work. So this causes a, an error in the measurement due to multiple scattering. The other effect, as described on the right, this restricted diffusion one, is remember the principle of dynamic light scattering is the particles are moving due to Brownian motion. And the algorithm is all built up about modeling the translational diffusion coefficient due to Brownian motion. Now, if we have a lower concentration sample, as you see in the right above, here the particle is free to diffuse as it wishes without any restriction. But if we work in a very high concentration system, these particles interact with other particles and they are not free to diffuse as freely. So this might slow down the particles, might change the diffusion, which would then change the calculated result. So these are two reasons why measuring at very high concentrations is not a good idea. And on this slide, I just give you some generalized results to understand what might be happening with your sample. If we're experiencing multiple scattering, then what we typically see, if the blue is the dilute, and this is a concentrated result in red, what happens is as we change the concentration, if we see a shift to smaller sizes in the concentrated sample, then we're dealing with multiple scattering. On the other hand, if we see a larger result in the concentrated sample than the dilute one, then we're probably dealing with restricted diffusion and the width doesn't change with restricted diffusion, we'll see an increase in the width in the polydispersity index if we're dealing with multiple scattering. So this just gives you a feel if you do a measurement without dilution and then with dilution. If you see changes, this can help you understand what's going on. But the important point is your results are changing with concentration and that's not okay. What we need to do is check concentration effects. And this is just some suggestion of how we're going to test this, and you should do this every time you're working with an unknown sample, unless the sample is already at such a low concentration, it's clear and you can see right through it. So the general idea is we would like to take a measurement, 
then dilute it, take another measurement, and see if our results change. Some people say, well, why should I have to do this? On the brochure of the instrument that I bought, it says it can work up to 40 volume percent. And sure, you can get a result every time, but that doesn't mean the result at high concentration is the best answer. In general, with dynamic light scattering, the more dilute the measurement, the more accurate the result. So what am I going to do if I'm just doing general work in the lab? If I can see right through the cell, I can't see any light scattering whatsoever, you probably can just measure it and be done. But if I see, as I look through the cell, that has like the usual blue hue, something like that, I can see through it, but I can still see some blue hue and some scattering. Then typically what I do is I do a measurement, then I dilute the sample two to one and I measure it again. And if I get the exact same result, well, then I say, I'm done, doesn't appear that concentration effects are terribly important. If I get a different result after I dilute, then I dilute two to one again, and then I see do I achieve the same result. And I keep diluting until I no longer see a change in results, and then I know that that is probably my most accurate value. Now, what if someone hands me a sample and I can't see through the sample? It's the light scattering is too high for me to be able to see through the cell. Then I usually start with a dilution of 10 to 1, do a measurement, and then dilute 2 to 1 or 10 to 1 again and do another measurement. So the basic story is here, do repeat dilutions until when you do the additional dilution step, you no longer see a change in the result. Actually, in the ISO standard for dynamic light scattering, it suggests for every sample doing like five concentrations and then extrapolating back to the infinite dilution value. And sure, that's good practice, but I hardly ever see anybody do this. But in the real world, you're working with an unknown sample, don't just stick it in the instrument and say, hey, I got a good result, I'm done. Always check the concentration effects. At least do a measurement, dilute two to one, do another measurement, and make sure you're getting the same results. There are other ways that will infect these measurements as well, such as sample prep and time of measurement. We'll discuss those as we go along. Now, one of the more difficult samples we might have to measure with dynamic light scattering if somebody hands us a powder or someone calls something a nanopowder. I'm personally of the opinion there's no such thing as a nanopowder, all powders aggregate. So if we have a powder and someone says, well, I know that this is a 50 nanometer silica powder or something, we need to disperse this in liquid to use dynamic light scattering, right? This technique only works on suspensions and emulsions. We have to disperse it into a suspension. So what we're going to do is disperse it, and what we're probably going to want to do is try to disperse it to the point where we're looking at individual particles. Because if we have, let's say that these are 20 nanometer powder particles, and if four of them are stuck together, they'll diffuse in a way that's similar to one very large particle of this size range. So if we don't disperse to the individual particle state, the answer we're going to get is going to be much larger than the size of the individual particle. And especially if people say, well, it was 100 nanometers, for instance, and I tested on SEM, well, these could all be aggregated together. They're just picking out the one that they like to see and call out the size. So especially if we're dealing with powders, this is where sample prep will be the most important when using this technique. Very often when we're working with powders, we're going to have to use all the tools in our toolbox. And our toolbox here for creating a good sample include our choice of solvent. Should we use a surfactant? Which surfactant and at which concentration? Should we use a stabilizer such as sodium hexaminophosphate? And should I use ultrasound? Here we see an ultrasonic probe. So let's go through each of these tools in our toolbox and look at how we can make these selections in the best way. In terms of choosing our solvent, here we just don't want the particles to dissolve. So ideally we're going to use water unless the particles dissolve in water. And we don't just use water, we use filtered water. And sometimes it's better to use a low concentration salt solution rather than DI water, as mentioned as we looked at how to do standards. Some powders just disperse better in alcohols, and it may disperse differently in IPA than in methanol. So if we are having trouble with water, the next step may be alcohol and see if that disperses better. Remember, if we're going to switch to an organic solvent, either for dispersion or for dissolution concerns, remember to change the viscosity in the NICOMP setup. Any error in your viscosity creates a proportional error in your final calculated result. So we're typically going to use water, and when we're doing our best work, we use low concentration salt solutions. Sometimes, especially in the pharmaceutical industry, people want to work with physiological saline or phosphate buffered saline. This could change the surface properties, but if it has to be used, but make sure you filter it. 
So how am I going to filter these solvents? Well, typically when we're at this point, we're just using syringe filters. And the most practical syringe filter to use for filtering your diluent, this is the Paul Acro disc, which actually is like a two-phase filtration at 0.8 and then 0.2 microns. So most often I just use this Paul Acro disc, and I give you the part number here for this filter. But if we're doing our best, most serious work, the best syringe filter you can buy is this Wattman Anatop 0.02 micron filters. They're very expensive, but these are the best filters you could use to make sure there are no particles in the diluent we are using. So choose a diluent where the particles don't dissolve. Choose a diluent where it disperses well. And please make sure, if you're doing careful work, to filter your diluent. Now, if we're going to work with surfactants, we have to choose which surfactant. Let's switch up here to how do we decide if we need a surfactant. So here's a powder that I just put into some water. And see how these are powder particles floating on the surface of the water? If particles float up here on the surface, then that means they have not wetted. And if they haven't wetted, then they're not going to disperse well. And this is when we use surfactants to make sure that they wet properly and go into the diluents so that we can disperse it properly. I then took this same powder, added some surfactant, and on the right what you see here is now, uh, some of this is sitting at the bottom and needs to be dispersed with an ultrasonic probe, but now they've been wetted and this is a sample that then we can get a much better measurement from. What do we mean by wetted? That means then when we take this particle, and it might be hydrophobic on the surface, by making the right choice of a surfactant, then what we can do is align the tails of the surfactant to adhere to the surface of the particle, and then we have the polar head sitting out here in the water. And this way, the water can coat the surface of the particle more properly, and then it goes into dispersion better. Surfactants are something we often use when working with powders. Even if we don't see the powder floating on the surface, sometimes the surfactant still helps us disperse the particle more evenly to achieve a better result. Let's go back to surfactants. In how do we choose our surfactant? A surfactant or a surface active agent, remember, has two components. There is the hydrophobic, the RC chain over here, and then we have the polar head here. There are four kinds of surfactants, non-ionic, anionic, where the polar head is negatively charged, cationic, it's positively charged, and zwitterionic, when it has both charges. In our laboratory in Santa Barbara, where I do a lot of measurements, we have a fairly broad range of surfactants so that I can choose which might work best for unknown samples. This is the collection of the typical samples we leave around. The choice of surfactant can actually be made beforehand if we know something about the surface properties of the particles. So for instance, if I know for a fact that the particles have a positive charge, then I would use an anionic surfactant for that particular sample. Most often I don't know much about the charge on the surface of the particles, and so what I'll do is I'll choose a non-ionic surfactant, which is rather neutral and should work for most samples. The non-ionic surfactants we keep around are shown here, and the one I use most often is EGPAL CA630. So that's the one I reach for most often. In many laboratories, people use Triton X100. If I need to use an anionic surfactant, I typically use aerosol OT. And if I know I need to reach for a cationic surfactant, I usually reach for Adogen 464. Now, for all of these surfactants, you never use these at full concentration. Before you use these, you always dilute them. If you don't dilute them, you're going to create all sorts of bubbles. Bubbles look like particles. You're not helping your measurement at all. So what I do is I keep bottles of diluted surfactant in the laboratory. And it's usually 1 ml into like 99 ml of DI water, mixed thoroughly, and then I keep this sitting there, and it should be good for a year. So when you're going to use surfactants, always use very dilute surfactants, usually at about maybe one volume percent. I take my sample and I typically just put the powder in the bottom of the beaker. Then I add one to two drops of this diluted surfactant directly onto the powder. Then I add the water. And this is the best approach for dispersing powders so that we can then make these measurements of the dispersion. But very often when I'm using powders, I'm still going to run into some trouble with time because they might re-agglomerate. And what I can do is rather than using DI water as my diluent, I might make up a solution of sodium hexametaphosphate and use that instead of just DI water. 
So what I'll do is I'll take about 0.5 grams of sodium hexametaphosphate, add that into one liter of filtered DI water, mix that for like a half an hour or an hour. And what this is going to do is actually going to help make sure that we stabilize the charge on the surface of the particles so that once we use something like ultrasound to break up the agglomerates, they don't agglomerate again. So in the most severe of cases, I'm not using DI water for my solvent choice. I'm using water with this concentration of sodium hexametaphosphate. So now I take my sample, which has been dispersed using a surfactant and maybe a stabilizer, and I'm going to make a measurement. And that measurement may look something like I see in the left here, where I see these two peaks, something at about 350 and something at 800 nanometers. If I have a reason to believe the 800 nanometer portion of this result are agglomerates, the best way to get rid of agglomerates is to use an ultrasonic probe, as you see on the image on the right. And how much energy we enter into the system might be important. So what we'll typically want to do is a quick study of how long do we turn on the sample probe and what does that do to our results. What you see here in the upper left, this is with no ultrasound. Then I give it 30 seconds of ultrasound, and we've done a good job. We've made this peak at 800 nanometers disappear. Then I get a mean size of 385 nanometers. I then add 30 more additional seconds of ultrasound. We get down to 355. So what we'll typically want to do is use ultrasound and measure maybe 10, 30, 60 seconds of ultrasound and make sure we know what level of ultrasound does the best job to disperse the particles. What you see in the lower right is just the very great difference between no ultrasound, where I have these agglomerates, and then once I've dispersed it properly, we'll then be looking at the individual particles. So if we're going to take powders and we're going to disperse it into liquid and try to do measurements using dynamic light scattering, it's very important to keep a range of surfactants around and also it's very helpful to have an ultrasonic probe. Ultrasonic baths can add some energy but nowhere near the intensity available using an ultrasonic probe. Another point, which isn't so much sample prep as using this system, is just time of measurement. Don't be in a hurry when you're using dynamic light scattering. And always test repeatability. The ISO standard says your repeatability should be plus or minus 5%. I think that's a little too tight. But if you're having some troubles with your samples and it's not repeatable, one of the first things you want to do is just lengthen the duration of your measurement. Within the NICOMP DLS software, you can actually create this time plot. And the red is the intensity mean, and the blue is the volume, and this color is the number weighted mean. And what you want to make sure is these numbers all stabilize as a function of time. And if they haven't stabilized, then you're not going to have very repeatable results. So at least five minutes for most samples, don't be in a hurry using DLS. Now in the lower right, what we see here, and let's just focus on the red result, which is the intensity mean. See how it's just growing with size? That probably means the sample is aggregating with time. And therefore, you're not going to have the same answer if you measure two minutes or five minutes or 10 minutes. And therefore, you need to go back and recheck your sample preparation technique to see why is it aggregating. And if it is aggregating with time, and especially if it was a powder to begin with, then you might consider that trick that I showed you using sodium hexametaphosphate, which fights this tendency for particles to aggregate with time. Just the last point on time of measurement, this came from this technical note as well on uh, method validation. You know, if you just do quick measurements, all of your answers are varying. But then if we wait until 10 minutes for this sample, and this was a fairly easy sample, all of these didn't really stabilize until we got out past, it looks like around eight minutes. So take your time with DLS. If you're not seeing good repeatability, lengthen your measurement. If you're not testing repeatability, you're not really being too concerned about the quality of your data. You always must test repeatability using any technique in particle size measurements. Another issue associated with sample preparation is choosing which cell we're going to use for the measurement. Now, when we supply NICOMP systems, we'll supply these disposable square cuvettes. You can purchase a glass cuvette, and for your most serious measurements, the glass actually has the least amount of uh, stray light scattering. is probably the best choice. But we also supply these 300 microliter round glass cells, which fit into the cell holder. So we're going to choose which cell, and for day-to-day -day measurements, I typically use these round glass cells if I'm just doing size measurements. But if I'm going to do size plus zeta potential, then I use the square disposable plastic cells because I can use this cell to make my zeta potential measurement. 
But for most day-to-day -day measurements when using a NICOMP, I use these round glass cells. And one additional advantage of using these round cells is they fit into a centrifuge very well. So let's say I do some measurements and there's a few stray large particles that I really am not focused on. I'm trying to focus on the individual particles. What I could do is put this round glass cell into a centrifuge, centrifuge it for five minutes or so. And what that's going to do is force the largest particles down to the very end of the cell. And that's not where we take the measurement. We take the measurement up here about halfway through. So if I want to reduce the effect of a few large particles, then centrifuging this cell makes a lot of sense to make sure I'm looking at, to the best degree if I can, the individual particles in that measurement. Now when I'm doing the most difficult kind of samples, what I can also do is use this very small volume cell, put it into a glass cell, and what I'm going to do then is add an oil into this cell, and it's a refractive index matching approach. What I'm going to do is put in either one of these two oils, and I leave you the names and the part numbers here. And what this will help me do is by matching these refractive indices, and I'm going to focus on getting the most light scattering out of the sample in here as possible. And if you look at the technical note that I wrote and is posted on the website, I'm measuring very low concentration proteins, measuring 0.1 mg per mil of lysozyme, this is a cell I used for those measurements because it was a very weak scattering sample. And this is a technique you use when I'm dealing with low concentration, weak samples, and I'm not seeing the kind of results that I like. This is kind of the extreme final approach you use to try to get those best results. So remember, with DLS, you're always going to get an answer. Every time you put a sample in there and you hit go, but that might not be the best answer. So now that you've heard this, you know the tricks to do. To begin with, look at concentration effects. Measure it, dilute it, measure it. If you don't get the same answer, repeat and dilute it again, and it's the lower concentration results which are the most accurate. The solvent that I choose really matters. Make sure the particles don't dissolve in it. Make sure that it disperses well in this solvent choice. And no matter what the solvent, water or anything else, make sure it's filtered. The surfactant matters, especially if I'm going to be taking powders and want to disperse them for measurements. The concentration of the surfactant matters. Maybe use an alt stabilizer. And the amount of ultrasonic energy is important. You know to do a study of how much ultrasound was entered into the system to try to disperse the particles to the individual particle state. If you use way too much ultrasound, you can agglomerate them again. So the amount of ultrasound is very important. As you're going through these steps, keep notes, especially if you're going to do method development. Even if you go down a path that fails, it's very important to know the failed paths when you're doing method development in case at some time in the future someone comes back and tries to reproduce your work. If you're running into difficulties getting not repeatable results, not what you're expecting, we are here to help you and we're happy to do that. But know that one of the first things we're going to ask you to do is say, all right, we're getting really crazy results. Um, did you run your standard, please? And let's just make sure everything is working right on a standard before we go down this path of looking at what might bring us to the position where we're not having the kind of results we're looking for.